Hello and welcome to the Access Festival. My name is Alex Chisholm and I'm one of the members of the team that's putting this festival on. Access is an arts festival focused on issues of access for people with visible and invisible disabilities, as well as equity for black, indigenous, and people of color. What is access? Access is about resources, justice, information, funding, opportunity, and more. We're presenting three programs here. Each program has its own theme. Program number one is what disability? Program number two is um, environmental barriers to access. And program number three is equity for black, indigenous, and people of color. The Gathering Place Association, in partnership with the Gathering Place Community Centre, with support from Kickstart Disability Arts, Spark BC, and the City of Vancouver are proud to present the Access Festival. And so I'd like to welcome the host of today's program. Hello, everyone. My name is Caroline Hibert. Welcome to all. The goal of this is Environmental Access Festival, and I will be hosting with an interview for Digger Dan, and there will also be Rachel Ransom, Laurie Landre, and Yuri Araj. There will also be a short film with the All Body Movement Dance Group. I love them, they're great. So today's theme is environmental barriers to access. And perhaps you're wondering, well, what kind of environmental barriers are you talking about? As you know, there can be physical barriers. There can be other barriers as well. For example, if I don't have an ASL interpreter with me, then I don't have access to communication at the same level as everybody else. Some of you have an experience with barriers that are specifically connected with the disability community. But as you know, because of COVID, there are actually a lot more barriers now. And so the level of access for many has changed. We need to have tools and information, sometimes just so that as a group we can get together, whether it's with work or having a safe place to have the creative process flourish. I hope that you enjoy today's program. I'm riding you over 
Brussies. Jade. Got it made. In the sun and the rain. In the shed. Jade. Your mama said. You there's nothing. Never dread you there's nothing I'd ever dread you there's nothing I'd ever dread hey thank you Get the wandering mic stand problem. I should have stuck with yours instead of my little creaky thing. Okay, this is called uh, Come and Play With Me. Understand it, and I'm blaming it. You know, that's what I always do with technology. Okay, I want to dedicate this to um, a fallen member of the spinal cord injury community, but I, I can't name names right now. 
because the family hasn't even released the information. So. Ten feet tall. You may think I'm going downhill. You might think I hit a wall. What you don't realize is that I'm ten feet tall. Is that I'm ten feet tall. Got some crazy friends that'll help to see me through. One of it, one of them to know I got your back too. I got your back too. Take life head on. I jam too much in. Burned out and judged. I 
ain't never done Some teachers think learning is a sin Some teachers think learning is a sin Some days I feel like the brother Chubby smiling if you hear I have faith in humanity Love will get us in the clear Extremists with your guns and your war. You got the nerve to tell me now that it's all the fault of the poor. Fight your evil wars, your evil, dirty wars. Life can throw an awful lot at you. Can knock you on your ass. If you don't get a little wiser now, me never last. Me never last. Things are a little tougher now, but most barriers don't belong to me. So going to organize all my buddies. We can set each other free. We can set each other free. Not asking for a lot, just asking to be let in. We don't even want the best seat in the house. Just wanna be with our kin. Just wanna be with our kin. my last one that's a Alex one that to trigger um. oh yeah it's for my dad this is called a uh, actually I won't tell you because it's kind of a pun not a punchline but you find out it doesn't make you, it's not supposed to make you laugh though, okay? <laughs>
He wished to carry it on in school. Maybe sometimes it felt like a mule. But he graduated life with honors, helping the supposed goners, and measuring with the carpenter's rule. He gave the shirt right off of his back. And he'd find another one on the rack. He'd pass that one out, cold in a blackout, warming up with the wise crack. Some are born into wealth of all kinds, but you earned it in order to find. You paid it for your debts, please have no regrets. Please rest in peace of mind. He was from the school of hard knocks. His pa died on the rocks. His ma gave tirelessly, and his sis provided harmony through Texas detox. A lucky man were you Not just one beautiful wife But two The book ends up keep you up While you clean the inside of your cup And learn to be straight and true Surrounded by other loving hounds the road that leads to the elk view pound. It wasn't just pets they took in, but the folks with the no next of kin, a loving lost and found. Some were born into wealth of all kinds, but you earned it in order to find. You paid it for your debts. Please have no regrets. Please rest in peace of mind. You're not responsible for my chair, but you're responsible for my hair. The apple falls not far from the tree. Yours provides shade and tranquility. And feel everywhere. You hardly heard any of my songs. Still, I'm gonna sing to you all night long. I hope you can hear them in heaven. Cause all I wanna do is leaven. So, until my swan song. This is not. Our final goodbye. The threads you tied are climbing to the sky. Miss you every day, dearest Dex decay. Tears will flow until I die. Tears will flow until I die. Some are born into wealth of all kinds, but you earned it in order to find. You paid it for your debts. Please have no regrets. Please rest, peace of mind. Please rest, peace of mind. Please rest, peace of mind. Thank you for having me. I want to thank Kick Kickstart Disability Art and Culture, and uh, uh, of course the Gathering Place and any of the organizers. Thank you. And the sound techs and crewmen.
Hello there. Hi. I'm so glad to see you. I'm wondering, what this name do you prefer? Digger Dan, Dan Digger, Dan, what would you like? Uh, Danny's good. We can go with Danny. <laughs> great, thank you. And this is a great opportunity. I, I'm looking forward to being able to interview you. So the theme of having environmental barriers to access and thinking about like for physical disabilities and this space with your music, what would you say are some of the barriers that you face? In this particular space, um, the door was fine, the elevator was good, the washroom was good. I went to the women's washroom, that wasn't on purpose. I wasn't trying to get any trouble on it. They used to do that at the Yale pub, the handicap washroom was in the women's washroom, so I've experienced that before. But it's good. I thought it was overall excellent. I mean, it's an ideal scenario with these wide areas, too. Really. Okay. Would you say that there have been any physical barriers in your being able to have access to expressing yourself with your music or in your going to show your music in different places? No, not particularly. Um, I, I mean, if we're talking about whether my condition has enhanced uh, or, or hindered my music, like in, as in the sense of how it's impacted me as a performer is null, null and void. My hands are completely functioning. Um, I'm one of the only VAMS artists with completely functioning upper body actually a lot of, a lot of them don't um and so uh it, it's and it's only helped me uh, a lot of things have helped me post injury too um having time not having as, enough money to get into trouble and music being a reasonably cheap hobby it was easy to put my time into it um, it also introduced me to a social system which was my union paying for my education and that that introduced me to uh social work and that uh, introduced me to songwriting. And then uh, it, things just kept growing. So I actually, I, 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 I blossomed because of, the, because of the disability. Yeah. So that's, but that's me. So the, the physical environment, if you're concerned about how, how that impacts me, that's different. Um, that's mixed. Um, stages are notoriously not friendly like this one um, in venues. And uh, that's okay. You can't expect to you know, the whole world to adjust for a small gang. But it's, it's certainly, when you think about access, like, it makes sense for the, set, for the crew and the tech crew to, to push stuff on, on wheels and carts onto the stage as opposed to having to haul stuff indiv individually. It's safer, it's, it's more efficient. So when you think about, that's, that's the idea of, you know, like universal access and design, it works that way. It, and it's a benefiting a lot of people um, that are unintended, kind of from the original plan. So... Yeah, if we always think wider, I think we help a lot of other people. We don't, we don't think we will. But there's specific groups. In disability community is very hard to put your finger on. Um, I mean, even in the deaf community, there's going to be divisions, and there's going to be divisions in, in, uh, in people with spina bifida. There's going to be multiple types of multiple sclerosis. It's, like, so diverse. You have to do a lot of uh, careful planning and, and lots of consultation to really understand it. You know, as a as a as a uh, member of power in society, that can make those decisions. Great. I'm also wondering um, how COVID has impacted your music. Do you feel that, or your life? Do you feel that there have been um, positive changes, or do you feel that it's a lot of negative impact that you're still reeling from? I think the people with disabilities know about lockdowns from the time they have their condition, um, either from birth, uh, if it's a congenital condition, or acquired from the point of, and that's what I think people with disabilities are probably more resilient during the lockdown because they're used to isolation and used to social systems sort of sometimes taking care of them. And um, that's my feeling, I don't know, uh, for me personally. Um, I'm a, I'm a busker for 75 to 85 percent of my music time, and so for me, it was just a matter of doing what I do most of the time. I didn't have to take a CERB. Um, I had it given to me without asking for it. 
Um, and um, I felt no effects. My um, partner is working at Whole Foods, so she was considered essential services, so our whole house was working still. We were very unusual. And um, yeah, so I would say economically, no, I was very lucky, exceptionally lucky. And I just think I'm really like proud of my disabled peers. Uh, I, I draw from them all the time. They're the most giving, balanced people I've met. <laughs> and they're the ones that get talked, talked to, like they couldn't teach anybody anything, but in actuality, people should be sitting down and listening to them talk and taking their advice on some, a number of things. It would, it would, it would startle you. I, I, um, I'm constantly amazed. Like the, they'll be dealing with multiple things, like my quad buddies, they have multiple problems just coming at them. Big health scares, one after the other, and they're giving back to their friends <laughs> all at the same time. And you're like, holy cow, how do you keep the ship floating and keep sailing? You know, so I, I'm, I'm proud of being this, in the disability community at this time. I think it's a good place to be. I feel like I'm one of those protected groups, you know, except for euthanasia laws, which have been loosened. But we can talk about that later. Right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's great. Um, I think that's about all the questions that I have for now. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> all Bodies Dance Project shares Parts, parts of, of Me, me. <laughs> choreographed by Harmony Taylor. Uh, I'm Janice Lawrence, the dancer. And we have audio description by Danielle Wensley and Nico Grizzling made this beautiful costume. Thank you. So Parts of Me is this beautiful collaboration between Janice and myself, but also about our love for our equipment, our mobility devices as disabled dance artists who find freedom and joy in dancing with our equipment. Our equipment is actually what makes it so we can dance and we can find freedom. So it became a love story for us as disabled dance artists to work with our equipment and how do we share that story. And Janice has such a unique story that we wanted to share that with you. I'm having a total love affair with my mobility aids and I kept going to All Bodies um, classes and I kept showing up with different mobility aids and they're just my partners. I always have a partner ready to go and I have my favorites, you know, depending on the day. But yeah, it's really fun to just explore movement and to express myself and be creative in harmony. It's the most amazing choreographer and dance teacher and all bodies is wonderful. So we're just so happy to be part of Vines. Thank you. Thank you. Parts of Me is set at Haddon Park near Kitsilano Beach. Janice is a white woman in her mid-50s. She is tall with long blonde hair. She is wearing a navy blue knee-length dress and plastic braces around her lower legs. Janice is on her back, laying on a woven striped blanket. The grass is underneath. Her hands are stacked on her belly. She begins to move slowly, softly, as though she is waking from a deep sleep. Her hands drift like falling leaves down onto the blanket at her sides. With knees bent, she rocks her legs from side to side. She is surrounded by her equipment, her manual wheelchair on her right, her collapsible cane on its seat, her four-wheeled walker on its side on her left, and her forearm crutches on the ground above her head. She sweeps her right hand across her hips, rolls onto her side, scans the length of her walker with her palm. Now her left hand scans the same pathway. She rolls onto her belly, a morning stretch, and like a mermaid surfacing for air, she presses her chest up with her arms then folds back onto her knees. She reaches under her wheelchair, Now slowly, she scans its outline with her left palm. She smiles proudly. She transfers her weight onto her seat as she continues to scan the horizon. 
Now her eyes are focused on her walker. Her expression is calm. She inhales deeply. She reaches to her walker, then wheelchair. She crosses her arms overhead as though she is casting a spell. With a burst of momentum, her hands float back down to her sides. Seated, she swings both legs up and over her walker. She lays down onto her belly. With both hands, she lifts her walker upright. It stands in front of her. She looks up, intrigued. She holds the bottom of its frame, pulling one side to snap it open, ready to dance on the concrete floor. Now she reaches behind her to lift her forearm crutches. One at a time, she swings them overhead. They are slick and dark blue. She places them carefully onto the seat of her walker. Still seated, she transfers her weight from one hip to the other as she shoots her arms up and down one by one. She rolls towards her wheelchair to begin their first duet. Janice is reclined on her left elbow. Her wheelchair sits on the grass waiting. She rolls closer and reaches around its frame. They fit together like puzzle pieces. She rolls away onto hands and knees and lifts one leg off the ground. She leans an ear towards her wheelchair, appearing to listen, then places both hands onto its seat and pulls herself up onto it. She hovers her legs off the ground and balances with her weight on one hip. She makes a suspended star shape supported by her wheelchair. She returns to a vertical seated position and rows her arms to the right. She arches her back, her face illuminated by the sun and her eyebrows raised as she reaches for the sky. She twists her torso to the left, rowing her arms again and she reveals her cool blue collapsible cane that is folded and compact between her hands. Now a trio with her cane and wheelchair. Janice rows her cane from side to side. Her feet pull her and her wheelchair onto the concrete. She tilts forward, setting her brakes on lock and leans back. Now she swings her right arm to her side and her cane shoots out into its full extension. It twirls then assists her to stand. She lifts it up with ease. It rotates above her head like a propeller. She whips it down behind her, pointing towards her walker. She tilts forward as she kicks one leg on balance with her cane and walker. With a single step, she places her cane down on her walker's seat, trading it for her crutches. Now a duet with her crutches. They land softly in her arms. She places her forearms into their holsters and arcs them one at a time away from the floor. She lifts them up at her sides, then overhead. They form an elongated upward cross. They uncross and drift through the air. She kneels onto her wheelchair seat as her arms and crutches float behind her. Now a trio with her wheelchair and crutches. Janice rotates and sits onto her wheelchair her crutches at her sides. Her feet pull her wheelchair into motion. Janice leans her weight forward into her feet and presses against the floor to throw herself back. They all whip into a backward spin. Her crutches soar in the air. They spin again. They stop next to her walker and she places her crutches back onto its seat. A quintet with her wheelchair, walker, cane, and crutches. She lifts her walker onto her lap, cradling it as they spin, her crutches and cane balanced on its seat. She places her walker down tenderly, stretching her arms as she leans towards it. Her careful forward steps guide her wheelchair and walker into circular motion. She leaves her walker a second duet with her wheelchair. It carries her swiftly, like paint strokes on the concrete. Her hands sporadically push its wheels to maintain momentum. Her feet push her backwards. 
She is jubilant as they twirl and roll together in long, sweeping pathways. They stop. Now a duet with her walker. Janice stands and leans into it. She takes her cane, then her crutches off the seat and lands them onto the seat of her wheelchair. She leads her walker backwards. They take turns teetering off balance while supporting each other. They sway softly back and forth. Janice spins and sits onto her walker's seat. She lifts her legs gracefully off the floor. She places her feet down and stands. She holds one side of her walker's frame. They pivot together. And they stop. Janice walks towards the blanket where the dance began. She leans down to gather it in her arms, softly waltzing as she drapes it over her wheelchair, covering her crutches and cane. She turns to lift her walker, and she places it on top of the blanket. Her wheelchair holds all of her equipment. She spins everything together one last time. She takes a few steps forward. She lifts her chest towards the sky as she gazes towards her mobility equipment, an act of reverence. Their dance is complete. With effort, she pushes the back of her wheelchair and leaves the concrete walking onto the grass, fade to black. Hello everyone, I'm Caroline, and I've lived in the Vancouver area for about six years now. I really appreciate the opportunity of being involved in this festival, and I really want to honor Stephen Litton, who assisted me. You know that there's barriers every day that we face, but we feel that being able to overcome them results in having confidence and allows for more of a level playing field. Sometimes, for example, with the history of ASL, there was a definite difference between the audiological approach or the communication approach to language, and children were taken from their families and focused on learning how to vocalize instead of learning language through communication. So the opportunity for being able to have access to history and full communication and language wasn't available. That has been adjusted now, and so we feel a lot more empowered. So instead of feeling that there's that barrier and those struggles, we've been able to overcome that I feel that for the future, there's going to be a lot more equal access, right? Hopefully everybody agrees with that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you.
Okay, so www.loveintersections.com There's so many parallels between deaf identity, deaf culture, and autistic identity and autistic culture. Um, I, I would view autism to be something you can take pride in, something that I can be proud and say, well, I'm autistic, that's part of my identity. It influences who I am and how I see the world. To pass as neurotypical in a neurotypical world gives you advantages. And this is where I see a lot of like queer parallels. If you don't act strange or act differently from others, then you're more likely to pass that job interview or be able to be in a classroom and have everyone include you. I like soft textures a lot. It's, it's very comforting for me. Stimming is how we express ourselves. It's a part of our natural body language. I can tell a lot about what other autistic people are thinking and feeling from how they stim and move their bodies. Um, and autistic body language is easier for me to interpret than neurotypical body language. Why is knitting a good stim? It's um, a socially acceptable way not to look to pe and in people's eyes. So that's really great. Um, it gives your hands something to do. You end up with a very nice finished product. It's also very soft. Um, everyone stims. Uh, everyone stims and everyone stims differently. Um, we all do it. It's just that for some people we do it in really cool ways. Yeah. <laughs> Queer culture is different from straight culture and autistic culture is different from non-autistic or holistic culture. Um, I think it's very interesting to see how queer space is such a different feel and how autistic space is such a different feel. Um, and where those intersect might be a really great space. Of course there's a lot of complicated feelings about disability. It's not all positive. There's a lot of ableism in the world. There's a lot of things that make it hard for me to function in this world purely due to the physical aspects of my disabilities. But in the end, I think that's all part of the human experience, part about human diversity is, is to embrace it, not shy away from it, and not try to fix or cure it. Fix the world, don't fix us. Uh, there's a lot of hope I have for the world to move towards that place. Hi everybody, welcome to our program today. My name is Yuri Arais. I am here to facilitate a conversation at the Gathering Place with Lori Landry. Hi Lori. Hi. Lori, can you take a few minutes and just tell us about yourself as an artist and... Um, yeah, I was born in Calgary. I read in Pink Boys. Um, um, I was born deaf. Um, I think it'd be better if I talk, but um, I was born deaf, and and I was raised mainstreamed um, in the school system in Prince George. So I've always been um, um, considered um, hard of hearing. Um, with um, oral training and um, lip reading skills. Um, I, um, with no connection to the deaf community, um, other than having a best friend who was deaf, um, who is also mainstream too. 
Então, um, I went to, um, I've always loved doing art in Cuba. And um, when I went to um, high school, I decided that I wanted to be um, an artist. So I, I worked to getting um, my grades for um, Emily Carr. Um, so when I graduated, I went to Emily Carr College, which was Emily Carr College at the time, now Emily Carr University. Um, but I only stayed for one semester because um, I was overwhelmed with um, living on my own, um, the lack of um, support um, for my needs as a hard of hearing deaf um, student. Um, and then, um, then, then I just worked. I just worked as a graphic designer for the longest, for a long time. And um, until about 15 years ago, I decided to um, take um, art, art courses um, at Emily <laughs> um, Because um, at the time, Emily Kerr had a certificate program in fine art techniques. So I thought, well, um, if my work will pay for it, um, I, I might as well take it. Um, so, um, so that kind of um, rekindled my, um, my love for art, painting, creating. And um, so I decided to become a professional artist um, after I finished my certificate program. Can you talk to us a little bit about the work that you're creating these days, your artwork? In these days? Yeah. Currently. Um, right now, I'm painting um, about the deaf experience, um, the, the language, um, the people, the culture. And um, so that was my main focus. And I've been doing um, what we call representational art. So I do a uh, portrait and, um, and self portrait. Um, so these are sort of like um, self portrait in a way because these are my hands. Um, so I'm signing the, um, the word related to the deaf. Um, with deafness. Um, so one with um, culture, um, the, one, the blue one, um, because um, the culture is about the richness of the deaf, deaf community and culture that we have. Um, it's unique in that thing that it's not just a disability, but also um, a way of life um, with, um, with the culture, the community, the language. It, um, it, it's not the risk, um, the richness of being deaf, uh, and, um, and the adaptability. Um, we, we know, um, the, um, we've, been, we've been focused on accommodating the non-disabled world. So we are accommodating the hearing. We are accommodating the people who are normal in that sense. Um, so accessibility is a, is a big issue for anyone who has, dis who has a disability, not just deaf. Yeah. I see that these two paintings of yours, as you just spoke about, directly represent mm -hmm. deaf culture and disability. Have you always worked your artwork in this? And I'm kind of also leading to a question of how does disability affect your work, your life, your creativity? Um, can you say that again, please? Sorry. I can try. Um, you were showing us a couple, these pieces are of yours, and they both represent uh, deaf culture and disability. And I was wondering how um, disability has, affects your work life, your personal life, and your everyday life. Um, how does it look about me? Um, well, it affects me in many ways that I, um, not being able to hear um, with my colleagues, like if I'm in a, um, if I'm in a doctor gap, doctor second, and I speak with my colleague, and it could be a group talking or something, and um, it, you know, someone would say, oh, did you hear about the grant that 
so and so is doing, but I miss out on it because I can hear, um, you know, I can hear that. So I miss out on that opportunity to apply for a grant or to apply for a so. Uh, um, yeah, so those are, those are the um, barriers that I face. Um, and the what other barriers do you feel that disability creates in your life? Barriers to that be it. Um, Only because you referenced, you know, that situation where you may not hear information, you might miss out on applying for a grant. Are there other situations where you feel that it really affects your everyday life like that? Um, yeah. Um, for example, right like now we're in the COVID um, pandemic and we have to wear a mask everywhere we go, and um, and it, it's very frustrating because um, I can't, I don't know what people are saying. For example, yesterday I went to see a doctor, I had a doctor's appointment at the, at the hospital. And, and it's amazing for me because I have to go through the entry and you know, wearing a mask and everybody's wearing a mask and I'm trying to figure out what they're saying and um, you know, all the directions that they give me. It's like, oh, go, go down there, you know, follow the blue line, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, and then I'm um, speaking with the receptionist who have no idea and it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, I can't answer you, <laughs> you know, because I don't know what you're saying. So, so yeah, so it back me, I think the COVID really opened my eyes more to to the barriers that we encounter, you know, things. I, I mean, I I I read lips and I can speak. Those are my privileges. But um, but when that being taken away from me, then I really really understand what everyone is going through mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. disability community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Is there anything that you could offer the general public? on what they can do to be more accommodating just in, in our general life as opposed to asking for accommodation? Do you th is there anything out there that you think would be really useful for people to hear? Um, more thingist, um, more, um, more patient, patient. If someone's not understanding, just patient, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, um, like when, um, when you're speaking to someone and that person going, you know, it's a it little facial um, expression, pick up on that. Um, because everybody's going through something different. Maybe someone has a um, hearing issue. Maybe someone needs um, a little more context in what you're saying so that they know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Lori, I really want to thank you for your time today and your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I really want to thank you for your time today and for everything that you shared with us. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> I'd like to introduce Amar Mangat, who's joining our conversation here with Lori Landry. Um, Amar, I wanted to ask you to introduce yourself a bit. Tell us a little about who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Amar. Sorry, <laughs> I won't have my sign name. My name is Amar. I have been in the film Intersections of Love, as well as another one, and I'm a founder of Signs with Amar, uh, which is a small business that I have started. I'm very thankful to be coming here today and be with you all in this interview and with Lori and Yuri. I was wondering our, if you could add to our discussion today, that's why we've invited you here. We're talking about access and barriers to access. I'm wondering if you can talk from your own personal experience as a person who doesn't hear, if you can discuss a little bit about the barriers that you experience in your everyday life. Yeah, so I grew up with many barriers. Um, the main barrier is obviously communication. I communicate in American Sign Language and that is my first language, that's what I grew up using. Um, and spoken language and sign languages have very 
similar or they run in a parallel however they are very distinct languages sign language has its own structure its own grammar and so growing up people not understanding that was a huge barrier and a huge challenge for me to learn to navigate um, it would be nice to be able to get rid of that for example writing back and forth with people being able to gesture sign when I'm in discussions uh, making sure that we're able to transparently communicate and understand each other. But yeah, communication is obviously the biggest issue for me because I am deaf. I'm very visual. I see, I communicate everything through my eyes and my hands and feeling things. And so I, I'm more of a sensory kind of person. My eyes are very important to me as a deaf person and in deaf culture because I, I take in all of my information through my eyes or through touch and feelings. Um, it helps me navigate through everything. And so a barrier um, would be trying to kind of shift the way that I approach things to match that visual and um, sensory, sensory approach. How were you able to find your way growing up? How did you figure out how to make it work for yourself? It was very challenging trying to navigate that growing up. Often I would feel like I just wanted to give up, but I had to remember that um, things can change. Sometimes something would happen and I felt like I wanted to give up, but I kind of made my, myself continue. Um, it's nice that sign language is now recognized as a way of communicating in the community um, because growing up I often felt very outsider and um, nobody really recognized that my way of communication was a legitimate way of communication and so trying to get interpreters was really important but hard to get um, because an interpreter can facilit facilitate the communication between English and ASL and make it a lot more clear and so growing up I did have interpreters I've worked with interpreters before I've had them in school and work in my personal life and I really see the benefit in having them there so that's one great way to get rid of that communication barrier but even in my own personal, personal interactions with people, if somebody doesn't know sign language or don't know how to communicate with me, we really just have to find a way to navigate that together, matching their preferences and my preferences. Now that I'm older, um, I'm in my later 20s, I'm 25, so my experience now often is writing back and forth with people, typing, using phones. Everybody's got their phones these days. Um, so technology has been very helpful with that. I've seen a lot of new apps and technologies that are available to help with that communication. And people are a lot more used to that now, which is great. Um, that doesn't mean that it's completely solved. There are still challenges that arise. Um, And yeah, you just have to figure out how to navigate that together with a person. It's a very one-on-one -on -one experience. I also wanted to ask you, as a cultural creator, now that you're saying you know, you've come this far, what kind of barriers do you find in that community in, in creating the work and the film work that you do? And how are you able to overcome and make that all work for you properly? Well, the two films that I was involved in, um, we did have interpreters available for that um, and so it was nice because it really bridged the connection with the community and being able to have an interpreter and a creative artist or a creator work together it's really fantastic because you're able to make all these collaborations for example one one film there was a voiceover so we were able to film it all in sign language and people were able to watch that and kind of see what the experience is reading the captions rather than having having a voiceover on the on the film and so um, I, it, it's kind of the same as it, it gave them a sense of my experience you know going to a movie theater and not having captions available there trying to figure out what the story is and trying to figure out what people are saying I have one more question for you if I may if you had to offer something out to us that we can do just as a general society to make life easier from an accessibility point of view, what would you offer? That's a really great question. Hmm. 
I think it's really important to work with deaf people, work with the community, talk about what their needs are for access. When you're planning an event, it's very important to be able to um, set that up with the deaf community and make sure that they're involved in that. You can collaborate with them, maybe host a few workshops to encourage people to be aware about the accessibility problems. For example, booking an interpreter, making sure that people know to do that or hiring somebody for captions. The most important, I think, is booking an interpreter and making sure captions are available when you're making videos. It's a really great opportunity to kind of set a precedent. Um, if you have a workshop explaining that, people will see that and understand, okay, that's what accessibility looks like. Mm -hmm. You have all of these things set up right away so that people feel comfortable going if they are interested. Um, you don't, the deaf people don't have to feel burdened by having to negotiate for an interpreter and to be able to access that. Um, the interpreter and the captions would support other people as well. So it's, it's really about building relationships in any kind of business or company or collaboration that you want to do. It's important to kind of build that relationship with the deaf community and progress with it together rather than just assuming what their needs are. We're here with Lori and Amar, and I wanted to ask you both to share with us your thoughts on the concept of accessibility and deaf culture where they intersect, where they don't, and what your thoughts are. I know in the deaf community, it's pretty small here in Vancouver. And so I know, I know who Amari is. We're not, we haven't formally met, but I know who he is. I know what kind of work he does, um, and I'm really curious to know more about that. I find that deaf culture is very supportive, but sometimes also we have, have our own issues. For example, So for people who are deaf blind or deaf plus, sometimes there's a, a little breakdown within the community there. Yeah, for sure, I completely agree. The deaf community really has its own unique way of showing its culture, I think, because people often, I mean, there's so many diverse cultures, backgrounds, ethnicities, the ways that people grow up. Um, but for example, in a family, the way that somebody grows up, deaf culture, if there's somebody that's deaf in that family, it's like adding another layer on it. So somebody who's gone to maybe a school for the deaf or has had that experience in the community kind of has to navigate the multiculturalism just within themselves. And they have, like deaf people, we have our own language, our own way of expressing ourselves. We have... Um, our communities that we're involved in. We have sign language. Um, there's deaf film, deaf theater, so many different things. Artists and the deaf community is very artistic in, in its nature, um, especially modern day, just because it's a very visual expression of yourself and deaf people are very visual. So it's, it's a really great way to kind of open ourselves up and be able to show our pride with sign language, with how we communicate with our gestures and our expressions and everything. And culture and accessibility kind of adds another layer of it um, because it, everything has to be accessible for us, right? The, the stage has to be lit well, we can see people up there signing or you have an interpreter hired for theater you know it's 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 not really a part of the culture but it's it, it's a part of the experience of being in the community so culture plus having access to that culture is really important and having the having the ability to gain both of those that's just one example that i thought of so yes i agree I was gonna say, so they are really two completely separate discussions. It's like, you know, the deaf, it's, it's a culture, and then there's accessible things that get brought into that culture as needed. I think that's a great thing to separate and to, to really fully understand. Lori, did you wanna say something else? 
No, not really. I think it's really, sorry, not the culture, the community. I think it's, there's lots of different deaf experiences. You know, there's some intergenerational deaf families and some deaf people are the only deaf person in their family, which means access looks different for everybody. And sometimes it's not easy because there's a lot of gatekeeping in the community. You know, some people think that if you're not from an intergenerational deaf family, you're not deaf enough. So I think that deaf people have barriers, but I think it's important that we need to work together. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that as well. Working together is vital in being able to g- kind of go on. It, it, nobody is deaf enough, you know, that's the common perspective that happens in the community and we really have to change that narrative because we're all deaf right but we have to just figure out a way to communicate with each other and get over those differences it doesn't matter how you grew up or your background or your experiences we have to figure out how to drop the stigma um, because there is quite a bit of that within the deaf community itself but it's really important to change that narrative and come with a better approach and a more inclusive um just accepting that if you're deaf you're deaf there's no deaf enough there's no specific identity that you have to be to be in the community we really have to change that perspective and from the community perspective i'm inspired by people who are deaf as well because you know myself i've never asked for support I've never asked for accommodation. You know, I've always just matched the hearing world. And I've never really thought about how to support myself or what things I might need. So, you know, it's never really occurred to me before or had never occurred to me before that I could ask for an interpreter. So now that I'm more involved in the deaf community, it's really amazing that there are those things available to me. Thank you both for your insights. It's really valuable to us. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Rachel Ransom, and I'm happy to be playing today. It's a marvelous night for a moon dance with the stars up above in your eyes. A fantabulous night to make romance neat. Thanks so much. Uh, this next one is a song I wrote a few years ago called Misty Morning. The misty morning's got me thinking about summertime.
Uh, my next one is one of my favorite songs by uh, Peter Frampton, which is Baby I Love Your Way. So this next one is your song by Elton John.
got me quite cross Well, the sun's been quite kind Well, I wrote this song It's for people like you that keep it turned on So excuse me for forgetting But these things I do, you see I've forgotten if they're green My next one is going to be a feeling good cover.
can go I don't know why I'm scared Cause I've been here before For every feeling, every word I've imagined it all You'll never know If you never try Forget your past And simply be mine Well I dare you to let me be My last one is Heroes by David Bowie, which is always in my set list because it's such a damn good song. It's one of those ones that I just wish I had written myself, but uh, he beat me to it by many years. So this is for Bowie. Thank you.